Welcome to History That Doesn't Suck. I'm your professor, Greg Jackson, and I'd like to tell you a story. But first, this episode is different. We are starting the revolution, and I don't want to take away from the gravitas of how this episode ends. You're going to like it a lot. But I also don't want an episode to go by without thanking you for listening. It's crazy to think that this is episode five. The support and feedback up till now has been great, so please keep it coming. And thank you to the Patreon subscribers who are helping to keep the figurative lights on. If you'd like to join those kind souls with so much as a dollar per month, you can find me on Patreon forward slash History That Doesn't Suck. And if you'd like to connect with other fans, check out History That Doesn't Suck on Facebook and Instagram. I'm there. Okay now, like I said, I'd like to tell you a story. It's September 28th, 1774, and we're in the city of brotherly love, Philly. More specifically, we're near the edge of the Delaware River in Philadelphia's old city neighborhood at a place called Carpenter's Hall. Given that it's the meeting house for the city's builders, you won't be surprised to hear it's gorgeous. Let me paint you a verbal picture. The two-story building's exterior is brick. While red remains the dominant color, Less frequent black bricks accent the walls. The builders achieved this by laying the bricks in the Flemish bond pattern. It leaves the black bricks barely visible when you view Carpenter's Hall from a distance, but they become clear and evident as you approach. This gives the walls a slight but pleasing checkered look. The north front entrance has white double doors with a semicircle piece of decorative glass above it. The doors and decorated glass are all framed together in a large, white facade. Each of the windows has white trim. On the lower floor, they also have white shutters. The white really makes them pop in contrast to the mostly red and few black bricks. The windows are all rectangular, with the exception of the three on the second story above the north front entrance, which are arched dormers. If you look up at the roof, you can see the hall's two chimneys on its east and west sides. You might also notice the Masonic compass and square at the top of the weather vane. The hall sits roughly 50 feet long and 60 feet wide. Oh, and construction was just finished this year, in time for the First Continental Congress, which is going on right now. Now, lest you think this is just a meeting of entirely like-minded patriots, or rebels depending on your point of view, let's survey the room. In the more than 50 wooden Windsor armchairs filling the hall sit men from 12 of the 13 original colonies. Yeah, only 12. Georgia doesn't want in the game at this point. And these men agree something needs to be done about Britain's latest acts, but they are of varying views as to what that is. We have the true radicals, like Sons of Liberty leader Sam Adams, who wants to get on with independence. We have others, though, who are still more cautious at this point, like New York delegate John Jay. Sure, he'll author some of the Federalist Papers down the road and become our first Supreme Court Chief Justice, but right now, he's for reconciliation. Then there's Pennsylvania's Joseph Galloway, and today, he's going to lay out a path for kissing and making up with Parliament. Joseph takes the floor. His wide-set eyes look out at the delegates from the 12 colonies, and he begins his speech. If we sincerely mean to accommodate the difference between the two countries and to establish their union on more firm and constitutional principles, hey look, there's no documentation for this, but as Joseph calls for a more firm union with Britain, I can't help but wonder, was Sam Adams rolling his eyes? Did his lawyer cousin, John, the Boston lawyer and future U.S. president, maybe give Sam a sideways glance with a smirk? But let's allow Joseph to continue. He wants to explain how the colonies didn't pull their weight in the Seven Years' War and how the taxes since its end in 1763 are justified. Back to Joseph. However painful it may be for me to repeat, or you to hear, I must remind you. You all know there were colonies which at some times granted liberal aids, and at others nothing. Other colonies gave nothing during the war. None gave equitably in proportion to their wealth to remedy these mischiefs. 
parliament was naturally led to exercise the power which had been, by its predecessors, so often exercised over the colonies, and to pass the Stamp Act. Against this act, the colonies petitioned parliament and denied its authority. Oh, Joseph says the Stamp Act back in 65 was cool and Parliament was right to be upset at the reaction here in the colonies? You remember Patrick Henry, the firebrand who spoke semi-treasonously while laying out his resolutions against the Stamp Act in Virginia's legislature, the House of Burgesses? Well, he's here. Again, no documents I'm speculating, but I picture Patrick taking deep breaths at this point. Breathe, Patrick. Breathe. Stay cool. Let's jump ahead. Here, Joseph acknowledges a, quote, want of constitutional principle in how taxes have been passed. But he is also clear about wanting to avoid a civil war. Because, yes, it would be a civil war. Remember, the colonies are British. Further, Joseph considers the tax, quote, neither unjust or oppressive, it being rather a relief than a burden. And, Joseph adds, to quote once more, I would therefore acknowledge the necessity of the supreme authority of Parliament over the colonies, because it is a proposition which we cannot deny without manifest contradiction while we confess that we are subjects of the British government. Huh. So there's disagreement in Congress. Who saw that coming? But wait, where did this Congress come from? And can they work together? I mean... Can the Joseph Galloway types of delegates have a meaningful and productive dialogue with the Sam Adams types of delegates? And of course, this Congress won't prevent war. The first battle at Lexington and Concord is coming. So today, let's make our way from this Congress to Lexington. Now to do that, we need to revisit the coercive acts and look at the reaction to them across the American colonies. Then we can revisit this Congress and see how the conversations between the more loyalist delegates and the more patriot delegates are going. From there, though, it's back to Massachusetts, and it's all action. Paul Revere and others are going for a midnight ride, and the next morning, we start the revolution with the bloodletting at Lexington. To understand the coercive acts, we got to put on our powdered wigs and try to view the American colonies, especially Massachusetts from Parliament's perspective. They've been trying to get these British subjects to respect their authority since the end of the Seven Years' War in 1763. As Parliament sees it, they've been patient and long-suffering while the Americans have marched, protested, burnt stuff, and otherwise destroyed stuff, and attacked government officials for about a decade. And we focused on Boston, because really, you've got to know what's going down in Boston during this time to understand the American Revolution. I mean, how could we omit the Boston Massacre and the Tea Party? But I hope you're not under the impression all the other colonies were playing nice. For example, when Parliament threw the Townshend Acts at the colonists in 1767, a Pennsylvania lawyer and colonial legislator named John Dickinson went on the offensive by writing a pamphlet called Letters from a Farmer in Pennsylvania. He totally went hashtag colonial viral. That's to say, it was printed, then reprinted, and read throughout the colonies. Another example. In 1772, some Americans lit up a customs vessel, the HMS Gatsby. It had run aground in Rhode Island. They burnt that sucker to a crisp. See, it's not just Bostonians who like to light His Majesty's stuff on fire. And these are just two quick not-Boston examples. You see my point then, right? There's rebellion brewing across the colonies. So when, on December 16, 1773, a small group of 30 to 150 guys in Boston don't just burn a ship or write a pamphlet, but destroy over 9,000 British pounds worth of tea belonging to Parliament's Golden Goose, the East India Company? Well, this bold destruction of a literal fortune is the end of Parliament's patience. The Boston Tea Party is basically the cherry on top of a go-screw-yourself ice cream sundae served to Parliament by all the colonies. Massachusetts, though, is the one handing over this not-tasty treat in our metaphorical ice cream shop. It does so while smugly asking Parliament, Can I get you anything else? No? Your total will be over 9,000 pounds. Cash or card? 
So I'm guessing it won't shock you then to learn that Parliament is in a punish Boston mood when it comes together in March 1774 to figure out how to respond to that expensive tea party. King George III wants an example made, and our Prime Minister, Lord North, is all too happy to oblige His Majesty. According to Cabet's Parliamentary History of England, Lord North, to quote, observed that this was the third time the officers of the customs had been prevented from doing their duty in the harbor of Boston. He thought the inhabitants of the town of Boston deserved punishment. He said, perhaps it may be objected that some few individuals may suffer on this account who ought not. But when the authority of a town has been, as it were, asleep and ineffective, it was no new thing for the whole town to be fined for such neglect. And Lord North isn't alone. To pull from the parliamentary history of England once again, Mr. Charles Van agreed to the flagitiousness of the offense in the Americans and therefore was of the opinion that the town of Boston ought to be knocked about their ears and destroyed. Delinda est Carthago. Ooh, that's Latin for Carthage must be destroyed. Let me just say, anytime you can work classical Latin phrases into a conversation, you're winning at life. Go for it. Now, if you aren't familiar with the saying, though, it's attributed to the 2nd century B.C. Roman senator, Cato the Elder. At the time, the Romans and the Phoenicians were having at it for domination of the Mediterranean. The capital of the Phoenician Empire was Carthage. Hence, in the eyes of the Roman senator, it had to be destroyed. So all that to say, when Mr. Van says, Delinda est Carthago. In this context, in 1774 Britain, what he's really saying is Delinda est Bostonia. Boston, the cradle of liberty as we now call it, more or less the capital of colonial rebellion, must be destroyed. Parliament's patience is gone. Boston must be destroyed. And so, Parliament creates the Coercive Acts. Do you remember them from the last episode? I'll remind you very briefly. There are four of them. One, the Boston Port Act, which shuts down the whole port of Boston starting on June 1, 1774. It can't reopen until the East India Company is paid back for the whole cost of last year's destroyed tea. Two, the Administration of Justice Act. The governor of Massachusetts can now transfer any government official or soldier accused of a capital crime to another colony or to Britain for the trial. Three, the Massachusetts Government Act. It changes the Massachusetts Charter. The council is no longer elected. It is crown appointed. Also, all town meetings other than annual elections now require the governor's written permission. And four, the Quartering Act. It's different from the first three in that it applies to all the colonies. It says that if a colonial town does not provide barracks to British troops within 24 hours, all colonial governors now have the power to quarter troops in quote, uninhabited houses, outhouses, barns, or other buildings as he shall think necessary to be taken. I feel bad for the soldier that was put in the outhouse. Just saying. Again, these acts are going to hurt a lot of innocent people. I mean, Boston is crawling with Sons of Liberty and others who are patriots to some degree, but there are still thousands and thousands in the city who either just aren't political or who are loyalists. I told you before, the city has a population of about 15,000. But between all the Patriot shenanigans I've mentioned, we've never seen much more than 5,000 Bostonians publicly support it. That means there's another 10,000 Bostonians not present, not participating. And that's just Boston. I'm not even talking about the rest of the whole colony of Massachusetts. Parliament knows all of this. It's aware that these acts will hurt innocent people as we saw in Lord North's quote, her innocent loyalists. But after more than a decade of patience, it seems Parliament has a new strategy, punishment. Hopefully, they think, Massachusetts and the other colonies will cower, and it will put them all back into line. Wow! Did these parliamentarians read the situation wrong? I'm going to tell you all about the response to the coercive acts from the other colonies, but really quickly, I've got to mention just one other not coercive act. It's passed about the same time and also hated by Americans, called the Quebec Act. 
(laughs) Ready for another mention of the Seven Years' War? Just have to remind you that Britain also scored control of French Canada at the war's end in 1763. So the French people in Canada, who remain French speakers to this day, well, they say they speak the French language, but some in France don't entirely agree with that. Whatever, personally, I find their French understandable, and Montreal is lovely. Anyhow, the French people in Canada, known as the Québécois, are suddenly British subjects in 1763. So the 1774 Quebec Act guarantees toleration of their Catholic faith. This act says, hey, Québécois, you're under British rule now, and we prefer Protestantism, but, you know, you do you. Stay Catholic. It's cool. And that's not all. The Quebec Act also lets them keep French civil law, and French civil law doesn't do trial by jury for civil cases. The act also did not create an elected assembly. Well, when the Americans hear about the act, their paranoia leads them to think this is a precedent for Parliament to take away American rights to a trial by jury in civil cases and to suspend their elected assemblies. Also, they fear the influence of popery or Catholicism. Ah, another awesome misunderstanding between Parliament and the Americans. Now, why did I tell you this? Because many Americans lump the Quebec Act in with the four coercive acts, and these five acts, all together, become known as the Intolerable Acts. Okay, Quebec Act noted. Now let's talk Colonial America's response, especially to the Boston Port Act. Do the colonies cower as Parliament wanted? That's not a no, that's a hell no. Colonial America's emboldened. On May 19th in Farmington, Connecticut, some thousand people come together and put up a 45-foot pole that they consecrate to the Shrine of Liberty. Next, they read the Boston Port Act aloud and burn it. They then pass five resolutions. My favorite is the third, and I quote, that the late act which their malice hath caused to be passed in Parliament for blocking up the port of Boston is unjust, illegal, and oppressive, and that we and every American are sharers in the insult offered to the town of Boston. On May 27th, some Virginians, including the fiery orator Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, and our old friend from Fort Necessity, George Washington, They come together, and they don't just condemn the act. They call for a Congress to talk about this crap. Let me quote a bit here. An attack made on one of our sister colonies to compel submission to arbitrary taxes is an attack made on all British America and threatens ruin to the rights of all, unless the united wisdom of the whole be applied. And for this purpose, it is recommended to meet in general Congress. Well, now we know where the Congress idea is coming from. And Massachusetts totally takes Virginia up on this. It's like, hey, let's all meet up in Philly. I hear their cheesesteaks are off the hook. Let's do it in September. I hear it's lovely there that time of year. Hey, quick note, I'm just kidding about the cheesesteaks. That's not a thing yet. Though Philly is the largest and most cosmopolitan city in the colonies at this point. And I do hear it is lovely in the fall. But the reactions against the Intolerable Acts don't stop there. On June 18th, Pennsylvanians whip up some resolutions. The first will do for us. It reads, Resolved that the Act of Parliament for shutting up the port of Boston is unconstitutional, oppressive to the inhabitants of the town, dangerous to the liberties of the British colonies, and therefore, considering our brethren at Boston as suffering in the common cause of America. Meanwhile, some, like the young Virginian lawyer and House of Burgess's representative, Thomas Jefferson, see these acts not only as an injustice to Boston, but as evidence of Parliament's diabolical plan to enslave the American colonies. In August, he produces a pamphlet called A Summary View of the Rights of British America. In it, he writes, Single acts of tyranny may be ascribed to the accidental opinion of a day but a series of oppressions, begun at a distinguished period and pursued unalterably through every change of ministers, too plainly prove a deliberate and systemical plan of reducing us to slavery. I know there's irony in Thomas Jefferson making a comparison to slavery. 
And I say we own that. Let's not brush anything aside. But I'm going to urge you to not knee-jerk reaction to the let's not talk about Tom owning slaves and just pretending that didn't happen corner. Or on the flip side, to the Tom is the worst human being ever corner. And I doubt you are. I think most people really want to understand the greater complexities than these two-dimensional takes on Tom. But the irony noted, I'm going to tackle these complications in a later episode because it can't be done as a quick aside. It deserves to be thoroughly addressed a little bit later. Cool? Okay, that noted, I think we see that Parliament clearly has no read on the American colonies, given that the coercive acts only embolden them and push them together. Hence, the meetup in Philly. Shall we get back to the First Continental Congress? Here we are at beautiful Carpenter's Hall in Philly, September 1774. We've already met the more loyalist-minded Joseph Galloway and still moderate John Jay. Peyton Randolph is also here. It was a quick mention, but you might recall him from episode two, and that Peyton and super patriot Patrick Henry have some history. Peyton did not approve of Patrick's resolutions against the Stamp Act. Well, both of those men are here today. I wonder how often they think about that beef between them a decade ago. Now look, I don't want to overdo this. I'm not trying to make the First Continental Congress appear more divisive than reality. As always, my goal is to hit it right on the head. But for the sake of clarity, I want to tell you that there is no open talk of independence at the First Continental Congress. Period. Few here, if any, want full-on independence. In 1774, patriots only want their rights as English subjects respected. That is, respected according to their interpretation. I will tell you, though, that I personally believe Sam Adams already wants independence. As Benjamin Rush wrote in his autobiography, quote, Samuel Adams once acknowledged to me that the independence of the United States upon Great Britain had been the first wish of his heart seven years before the war. Close quote. And that makes sense. That would be 1768, which is the year the Redcoats first occupied Boston. I can see the fiery Samuel reacting that harshly to occupation. There's no one else I would identify as being this radical yet, but I would also speculate that Sam's probably finding some sympathetic ears among other delegates, probably late at night in a tavern over a beer. Even as I say this, though, please know other historians may not agree with me, and that's okay. But one thing we can all agree on is that no one is talking independence during the actual sessions of this Congress. I am choosing to highlight the disagreements here because a common misconception I often see in students is the idea that the Founding Fathers agree on everything. No, they don't. Some people will leave this Congress and future meetings frustrated. Some will refuse to sign the documents produced by a few of these meetings. Others sign, but wish the documents read differently. Their signatures are not always an act of complete agreement, but a sign of one of the most important things for politicians to do if government is going to work. Compromise. We aren't going to meet all the 50-plus delegates, but since we focused on some of the more moderate ones, let's round this out by meeting a few delegates from the other end of the spectrum. Already mentioned are Sam and John Adams from Massachusetts. Sam, as I just said, is the most radical of all of them. We also have some fairly radical reps from Virginia, such as Patrick Henry, who's ever ready to spit speeches that change hearts and minds. We also have the similarly named but distinctly different Virginian Patrick Henry Lee, and we'll see him play a major role with the eventual decision to declare independence in a later episode. So not today, but he's worth meeting. And although I wouldn't call him a radical, we do have to mention one other Virginian who's present. The capital F founding father, George Washington. So there are a number of well-known delegates whose reputation certainly precedes them. Given that, can we take a moment and think about how cool this must have been for a lot of these guys? Most of them have never met. They couldn't exactly zip around in airplanes or enjoy the luxury of the then non-existent U.S. interstate highway system. It's a big deal for someone to travel beyond their home colony's boundaries at the time. 
So even though someone like Sam Adams might have read about Patrick Henry's resolutions in a 1765 Boston newspaper, they haven't met. You know there's a little man crushing going on. This first Congress meets from early September to late October, 1774. Basically, everyone could agree they want Parliament to repeal the Coercive Acts and the Quebec Act, as well as any existing revenue acts. That part's easy. So partly covering that, on September 9th, Congress endorses the Suffolk's resolutions produced by patriots in Suffolk County, Massachusetts, that same September. These resolutions call the Coercive Acts unconstitutional and say Massachusetts should set up an independent government until they are repealed. On September 28th, Joseph Galloway, who we met at the opening of this episode, proposes his plan of union. He wants to create a colonial parliament that will work with Britain's parliament. Not the worst idea, but it narrowly doesn't pass. Five colonies vote for it, six against. After Joseph doesn't get his way, his somewhat moderate tone shifts way more loyalist. In 1776, he joins the British Army in New York, and by 1778, he moves to England while Pennsylvania's General Assembly convicts him of high treason. This colonial-born delegate to the First Continental Congress will live out the rest of his days in Britain. On October 14th, the Congress agrees on their Declaration and Resolves. It packs quite a punch. Basically, it rejects any assertion that Parliament has power over the colonies and that, quote, the colonies are entitled to the common law of England. If you're familiar with the Declaration of Independence, well, it reminds me of it a little, in that it lists the many sins of London against the colonies. On October 20th, the Congress agrees on its Continental Association. This document calls for serious economic sanctions. First, non-importation, starting on December 1st. Then, Colonials are to stop consuming British goods by March 1st, 1775. Finally, non-exportation, as in the colonists won't sell to Britain, will kick in on September 10th, 1775. The Continental Association is accepted by all 12 colonies except New York. The Congress may have passed it, but New York's assembly refuses. Its members are still too loyalist for that bold of a move. Now, this isn't germane to the Battle of Lexington and Concord, so again, we don't want to get pulled off course. But I think it's important to note quickly that among the things this Congress also affirms, quote, under the sacred ties of virtue, honor, and love of our country, it's that it's going to cut off America's participation in the slave trade. To quote, we will neither import nor purchase any slave imported after the first day of December next after which time we will wholly discontinue the slave trade and will neither be concerned in it ourselves, nor will we hire our vessels, nor sell our commodities or manufacturers to those who are concerned in it. Like I said with Tom just a few minutes ago, the issue of slavery is ever present. Revolutionary Americans knew ending slavery was only consistent with their ambitions and values. This declaration doesn't work. I'm sure you know that, but we do well to realize slavery is always in the background. Well, these are the major accomplishments of the First Continental Congress, but we can't leave without quoting smooth talker Patrick Henry. With all these delegates together, he says, quote, The distinctions between Virginians, Pennsylvanians, New Yorkers, and New Englanders are no more. I am not a Virginian, but an American. Oof. Well, now isn't that a little spine tingling? Let's be careful not to put these men on unfair pedestals, but you got to appreciate Patrick's way with words. It seems then that the delegates, moderate loyalists and patriots alike, managed to come together, to appreciate each other's points of view, to compromise. Now, one last thing about this Congress. This is important. Listen up. They vote that if the king doesn't take action to right these wrongs, they will meet again for a second Congress on May 10th, 1775. Well, that meeting is definitely happening. Blood will be drawn at Lexington weeks before then. So building to that, let's start with King George III's disposition at this point. 
he writes to his prime minister, still Lord North, on November 18, 1774, quote, The New England governments are in a state of rebellion. Blows must decide whether they are to be subject to this country or independent. Damn. Blows? So the king's basically done seeking a peaceful response. For him, it's already on. It isn't until early the next year, on January 19th, 1775, that Parliament formally receives Congress's declaration and resolves. It doesn't go over well. This document just confirms for Parliament what the King said in his letter to Lord North last November. Massachusetts is in a state of rebellion. So on January 28th, the Secretary of State for the Colonies, Lord Dartmouth, sends word to General Gage who isn't just the general anymore, by the way. He is also the governor of Massachusetts. And he orders Gage to arrest the rebellion leaders and to destroy their ammunitions and arms. It takes months for these specific orders to get to Gage. They don't arrive until April. In the meanwhile, though, the seizure of arms is already underway. In February, Gage sends Colonel Leslie to seize cannons reportedly kept in Salem, Massachusetts. The colonel meets resistance. Now this time, the situation doesn't escalate, so no war just yet. The following month, March 1775, Virginians hold a convention weighing whether or not it will accept Congress's resolutions. Virginia is still fairly moderate, so it really could go either way. Then Patrick Henry gets up to speak. The address is longer than this, but let me quote the silver-tongued man once more. At the ending, he says, Is life so dear, or peace so sweet, as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God! I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Yes, this is where those famous words were spoken. It sways the convention. Britain responds by dissolving the House of Burgesses, seizing gunpowder in Williamsburg, and trying to incite a slave revolt. You have to remember, enslaved African Americans are barely a minority in late 18th century Virginia. After this, Virginia is squarely on the side of the Patriots. We're focused on getting to Lexington, right? But we should note the same irony here that we did with Thomas Jefferson earlier. Patrick is a slave owner who's drawing on the image of slavery. And he, like Tom, supports the Congress's resolutions aiming to end slavery. So I'll say it once again. We'll tackle this Gordian knot of a problem in due time. But for now, take Patrick's words as yet another reminder of slavery's ever-present place in colonial America. That all said, let's get to the situation in Massachusetts. Lord Dartmouth's order to seize and destroy munitions and arrest rebel leaders arrives in Boston on April 14th. Lord Dartmouth doesn't name names, but leaders could be well understood to be John Hancock and Sam Adams. And word is, John and Sam are hiding out in Lexington. Now before we can send in the troops, you need to know that back in Boston, the Patriots have something of a spy ring going on. Yeah, I guess before we ever figured out the Constitution, you could say we'd already figured out the CIA. So here, Paul Revere tells us in a letter that, to quote, In the fall of 1774 and winter of 1775, I was one of upwards of 30 chiefly mechanics who formed ourselves into a committee for the purpose of watching the movements of British soldiers and gaining every intelligence of the movements of the Tories. We held our meetings at the Green Dragon Tavern. We were so careful that our meetings should be kept secret that every time we met, every person swore upon the Bible that they would not discover any of our transactions but to Mr. Hancock, Adams, Drs. Warren, Church, and one or two more. Real quick, two things you should have gotten from that quote. One, Tories are loyalists. Two, the Green Dragon is the best name for a tavern. Ever. Oh, and you know what? It's time. Listen, History That Doesn't Suck fans, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere and all the other people that are riding that night. But yes, Paul is definitely one of the central figures. So let's get Paul from April 15th 
to the moment he hears the first shots at Lexington. And by the way, I'm pulling heavily from two of Paul's accounts going forward, paraphrasing and even quoting a bit, but I'm going to keep this in my voice for the narrative's sake. Paul and his fellow Bostonian Jason Bourne predecessors take turns in teams of two watching the soldiers at night. On Saturday, April 15th, around midnight, they see movement. Boats are on the move, and the light infantry of grenadiers are taken off duty. Paul says he and his buddies figure this means something serious is about to go down. Now, as we fast forward a few days to get to the night of April 18th, the night of Paul's ride, and the last time the sun sets on a British America before war breaks out, we need to introduce another possible spy. We don't know this for sure, but she likely informed the Patriots of Gage's intention to secretly send troops under the cover of night to seize arms and Concord. This probable spy is none other than Margaret Kemble Gage, Governor Gage's wife. See, Gage has been in America for a long time. He fought in the, yeah, you know what I'm going to say next, right? The Seven Years' War, and he fell for a local. Margaret comes from Gentry, but she's American Gentry. She's from New Jersey. And even in the 18th century, you don't mess with a Jersey girl. But whether it was Margaret or not probably was, the Patriots know Gage's intentions. Okay. April 18th, 10 p.m. Soldiers have gathered at the bottom of the Boston Common. Dr. Warren sends for Paul, who heads over to the good doctor's house. Dr. Warren begs Paul to hightail it to Lexington to warn John and Sam. Paul must tell them of the troops' movement and that Dr. Warren suspects the troops are coming for them. The docs already sent William Dawes to Lexington as well, but William has gone by land. Paul will go by sea. Let me explain this by land or sea thing, which is also a line you might recall from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's famous, beautiful, but not so historically accurate poem, Paul Revere's Ride. You have to remember that Boston has expanded its shoreline since the 18th century. Like a lot. Boston of 1775 is a peninsula. The only thing keeping it from being an island is a narrow neck of land called the Boston Neck that runs south of the city into Roxbury. So if you're in Boston, and like Paul, you want to head to Lexington, you can go that way. Or you can go north, row across the Charles River, which is way wider back then, and then travel more or less directly west. Lexington is about 15 miles northwest of Boston and Concord with its cache of arms, is the next small village a few more miles west. It's a short drive today, but back then, it's hours of travel either way. So when leaving 1775 Boston, it's a real question. By land or by sea? Dr. Warren's covering his bases. He's already sent William by land. Now Paul will go by sea, crossing the Charles River. Hopefully, one of them can make it to John or Sam in time assuming they are even targets, as the doc thinks. Okay, back to Paul. He leaves Dr. Warren's and calls upon a friend, asking this friend to go to the North Church and set two lanterns at its steeple. Paul and his contacts across the Charles River in Charlestown have previously agreed upon this as a signal. If Paul's friend had put up one lantern, it would have meant the Redcoats were coming by land, via the Boston Neck. But Paul asked his friend to put up two. That means the Redcoats are coming by sea. In other words, like Paul, they are crossing the Charles River. While Paul's friend gets the lanterns up, Paul goes home, grabs his boots and coat, and heads to Boston's northern coast. Two other friends now row Paul across the Charles River under the rising moon. They row past a British warship, the HMS Somerset. Paul disembarks in Charlestown, where his contacts there tell him they received the lantern signal. They also provide Paul with a horse. As he mounts, Richard Devins tells him that, as he came back from Lexington this evening, he saw ten British officers. They were mounted on horses, armed, and heading up the road. Okay, pause. Do you see all that's going on? Like I said, Paul is definitely a central figure in tonight's events. No doubt. 
Longfellow didn't choose badly in writing a poem about the guy. But as you can see, friends are helping Paul. William is carrying out the same mission by the land route, and Paul is still gathering intelligence on his way. This is a whole network in play. Paul's an important part, but a part nonetheless. Okay, back to the story. It's 11 p.m. now. Like Boston, Charlestown is another peninsula. So Paul rides towards the Charlestown Neck. Just past it, he sees two men, both on horseback under a tree. Now remember, it's 11 p.m., so even with that rising moon, it's dark. It isn't until Paul gets close that he realizes they are British officers. They pursue as Paul takes off at a gallop back toward Charleston Neck. Then, on to Medford Road. He manages to lose his pursuers when one of the soldiers' horses gets stuck in some clay. Paul then heads to Medford. Sorry, this is killing me. I have to pronounce it correctly. Paul then heads to Method, wakes the captain of the Minuteman, and alarms basically every house on the way to Lexington. Finally, Paul gets to Lexington, where he finds John and Sam hanging at Reverend Jonas Clark's place. Jonas is married to John's cousin, so there's the connection. Paul tells them everything that's happened tonight. He also asks, has William arrived? No. Damn it. Maybe he got caught. To his relief, 30 minutes later, William shows up. Looks like Dr. Warren's precautions worked, even if Paul hadn't made it. William would have gotten the word to John and Sam. After some refreshment, Paul and William take off for Concord. Gotta warn them about the troops coming for the arms. While riding, another son of liberty, Dr. Prescott, catches up with them. The three of them continue on together, warning everyone that the troops are coming. Now you might be wondering, where did this Dr. Prescott fellow come from? The young patriot and doctor is just leaving the Lexington home of his fiancée, Lydia, to head back to his place in Concord at uh, 1 a.m. What, you think people don't have <clears throat> uh, personal lives in the 18th century? Well, while these sons of liberty continue to warn the inhabitants of the countryside, Paul notices two men on horses, just like he had outside Charlestown. Uh-oh, that's not good. He knows it. He calls out to the dock and William, but just then Paul finds himself surrounded by four soldiers. God damn you, stop. If you go an inch further, you are a dead man, one says to Paul. William sees an opportunity to ride off and he takes it. Paul and the dock, though, are stuck. The soldiers, armed with pistols and swords, force the pair into the pasture while threatening to, quote, blow their brains out. Suddenly, while sitting in the field, Dr. Prescott yells, Put on! With that, he and Paul ride hard in opposite directions. The doctor makes for a low stone wall, jumps it, and gets away. Dr. Prescott will be the one who actually makes it to Concord to warn the patriots there of the coming redcoats. Meanwhile, Paul heads for the woods at the bottom of the pasture. He's riding hard, but no dice. From the woods emerge six more soldiers on horseback taking the reins of Paul's horse and pointing a pistol at his chest, they force him to dismount. Where are you from? asks the soldier who appears to be in command. Boston, Paul responds. At what time did you leave Boston? Uh, 10 p.m. or so. Paul goes on, adding that he's seen their troops, that they caught a ground in crossing the Charles River. And he also lets him know that he's alarmed the country all the way up and 500 Americans or so will be here in no time. This response seems to surprise the commander. May I crave your name? The commander asks. My name is Revere. What? Responds the commander. Paul Revere? Yes, Paul responds. Seems Paul's known by the Redcoats. More soldiers arrive. Paul identifies one after the fact, as Major Mitchell of the 5th Regiment. This Major claps his pistol to Paul's head, calls him by name, and proceeds to ask similar questions to what the commander had. And if you don't give me true answers, I'll blow your brains out, the Major says. Clearly, there was a theme this evening. Next, they search Paul for arms and order him to remount. As Paul grabs his reins, the Major takes them from him. By God, sir, you are not to ride with reins, I assure you. 
the major hands them over to another officer to lead Paul's horse. They take him back toward Lexington, insulting him, calling him rebel all the way. As they approach the Lexington meeting house, they hear a volley of guns fire. It's likely an alarm. The soldiers stop. The major asks Paul how far it is to Cambridge. After further questions and consulting each other, the major makes Paul dismount and give his less fatigued horse to the sergeant. They cut the bridle and saddle of the sergeant's horse, obviously to make it difficult for Paul to ride. And with that, they let him go. Paul heads straight to the Reverend Clark's home, where he again finds John and Sam and tells them everything that's happened. John and Sam decide to make for the nearby town of Woburn. Initially, Paul goes with John and Sam a ways, but then doubles back to Lexington with John's secretary, Mr. Lowell, to get a trunk with papers belonging to John. Whew. Well, while grabbing the trunk, Paul sees the Redcoats marching toward Lexington. Yes, they are that close. Heading outside, others are warning that the troops are nearly here. Paul makes his way through Lexington's green, a large open field, like a smaller version of the Boston Common, where he figures 50 to 60 Patriot militia are gathered. Let the troops by and don't molest them. Without they begin first, Paul hears a commanding officer call out. Paul and Mr. Lowell are about a hundred yards away from the meeting house when he sees troops again. They halt. Paul hears a shot. Two more guns go. He can't tell who fired first, though. A building blocks his view. Finally, the roar of musketry explodes as he and Mr. Lowell make off with John's trunk. Wait. The war just started. What? How? So let's make sure we got it all. Time to rewind. Here's a redcoat version. I'm pulling from the account assumed to be written by Lieutenant John Barker, who numbered among the redcoats at Lexington, and from Gage's short mention of this, quote, incident, as he put it, in a letter to Lord Barrington, the Secretary of War. Gage has learned of a cache of military stores being collected at Concord for the avowed purpose of supplying a body of troops to act in opposition to His Majesty's government. (laughs) Well, from that perspective, I guess the seizure doesn't sound so oppressive. He sends the Grenadiers and light infantry from Boston. Lieutenant Colonel Smith of the 10th Regiment and Major Pitcairn of the Marines command the men. Lieutenant Barker tells us they number around 600 and depart Boston around 10 or 11 p.m. Few but the commanding officers even know what this expedition is. And sorry, I've got to break in just to add to the lieutenant's account. Perhaps few redcoats know, but it seems Boston spies and every patriot knows what's going on. <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> As I was saying, the soldiers don't know. They get across Cambridge Marsh as Lieutenant calls it, and stand in water up to their knees until 2 a.m. Finally, they march. They catch a few Patriot messengers, Paul Revere types, along the way. About five miles shy of Lexington, they hear hundreds have gathered to oppose them. April 19th, 5 a.m., they arrive at Lexington. The Lieutenant counts two to three hundred Patriots. He's really overestimating, but this is his version. The Patriots stand opposite them on the town's grassy common, the green. The lieutenant says he and his fellow soldiers continue to advance, ready to fight, but not intending or wanting to do so. As they get close, though, the Patriot militia, quote, fire one or two shots, upon which our men, without any orders, rushed in upon them. I wonder what was going through the lieutenant or any of the other hundreds of soldiers' minds. I mean, his massively overestimating the number of Patriot militia makes me wonder if that wasn't the fear of battle at work. Was he or any of the other hundreds of British soldiers ready to fight that day? They didn't even know why they were on the move that morning. Were they shocked at the sound of that first shot, even if they greatly outnumbered the Patriots? But wait, that's fairly different from the way the Patriots remember this going. We gotta fire this shot again. Once more, rewind. Here's the Patriot version. I'm pulling from the Reverend William Gordon of Roxbury, the Reverend Jonas Clark, John Hancock's cousin-in-law in Lexington, 
and the account of Sylvanus Wood, a patriot militiaman. He recorded this long after the fact, in 1826. The king's soldiers, numbering 800 or better, according to Reverend Gordon, 1,200 to 1,500, according to Reverend Clark, depart from Boston to move on Concord to seize its arms. Like the lieutenant's overestimation of patriots at Lexington, both of these figures are far too high. Lexington's patriots learn that these troops are headed their way shortly after midnight when a rider sent by Dr. Warren arrives. I assume that's Paul. With this news, the alarms are sounded and patriot militia gather to discuss what to do. They decide to dismiss the men, but they are to stay nearby and be ready to reassemble. Naturally, a good number of them head to the local tavern. It might be 2 a.m. in Lexington, but it's 5 o'clock somewhere. Between 3 and 4 a.m., a rider comes. He says the British are nearly at Lexington. April 19th. By 4.30 a.m., alarm guns are fired. Drums beat to arms. The militia gathers, including Sylvanus, a resident of nearby Woburn. He's heard Lexington's alarm from three miles away. The Patriot militia is figured to be around 50 to 60 in number. Later figures will say as high as 77. Sylvanus in his 1826 account, put them all the way down at 38. And he says he counted every single one. The Redcoats arrive. The Patriot militia stand in formation on the green, though not in the accounts I'm primarily drawing from. Let me add that others have said, as Paul Revere did, that the Patriot captain, John Parker, said something to the effect of, quote, Stand your ground. Don't fire unless fired upon. But if they want a war, let it begin here. Huh. Doesn't want to fight, but will if the other side forces it. Huh. Yeah, that's about how Lieutenant Barker describes the British view, isn't it? One other thing real quick before we get back to the narrative. Our sources do not agree on the chronological order of the following specifics. Back to our narratives. Captain Parker sees the futility of standing against these far larger numbers and tells his men to disperse. He does this either now or sometime after threats from the British. As the British troops march in, Reverend Clark says three officers ride up to the Patriots. Sylvanus says it's one British officer, and the Reverend Gordon identifies him as Major Picairn. Whoever is right, at least one British officer rides up close, brandishing his sword, and says something to the effect of, Ye villains! Ye rebels! Disperse, damn you! Disperse! Lay down your arms, you damned rebels! Or you are all dead men. No one knows at what precise moment Captain Parker tells his men to disperse. But the accounts seem to agree that not all the patriots did disperse, or at least that they didn't do so fast enough for the British officer's liking. Now again, the British accounts we looked at here say the Patriots fired first, but all of these accounts say either the British fired first or that it's unknown, and frankly, we will never know. But I'll tell you what I do know. I can imagine being in the head of one of these Patriot militia, maybe one of the younger ones. Can't you? They aren't real soldiers. Sure, they've trained, but not like the Redcoats. So you're one of them. Your numbers are around 60 strong. You stand in the open grass of Lexington's Common. Here come hundreds of soldiers in their matching uniforms lining up opposite of you. There have been plenty of attempts to seize arms in the past, like the one at Salem last February. So, maybe this won't get violent. But they're getting closer. And they're getting closer, and you hear them yelling, Ye rebels, disperse! Damn you, disperse! Oh, damn! Your heart's pounding. Do you feel it in your temples? This doesn't feel like a threat. Isn't this just another threat? You hear the British soldiers advancing, the soft thud of 700 boots in unison, the clatter of muskets, and you think, why can't I get my hands to stop shaking? Damn it. Calm down. Calm down. Wait, what? Did he say disperse? Did, did the captain say disperse? Did, did John say disperse? Damn you, you rebels. Damn it. Can't it be quiet? I just got to think, but I can't think. And the adrenaline is taken over your body, and the fear is coursing through you, and now... Wait, half of everyone is walking away. Maybe I should be walking away. Why don't I move? Oh, God. I don't want to be here. 
Join me in two weeks where I'd like to finish this story. 